So this morning, we're, gonna, we're starting a, a brand new sermon series that's going to actually take us to uh, Easter, as you see on the screen. Uh, it's called Eight Days That Changed the World, and we're going to actually look at the week leading up to Easter Sunday, and we're going to start with today, with, with Sunday before Easter, and we're going to go there. Now, some of you who, are, who, um, who kind of are, st- are stickler for details, you may have already noticed that counting today, there's only seven Sundays until Easter, and so you're kind of panicked because there's eight days, and what are we going to do? Well, on the last day, on Easter Sunday, we're actually going to be looking at the last two days. We're going to look at day seven and day eight, and it's going to be a, it's going to be a powerful Sunday, and you won't want to miss it. Actually, if, if you can do your best to be here for all of these, uh, it's going to be great, because be, we're going to be doing some special things um, in, in each of the services uh, that, that we're looking forward to, and so I hope that you will, you will be a part of that. And so today we're going we're gonna to start off with the Sunday before Easter, uh, which is typically, it's, it's called Palm Sunday, and it's Jesus' triumphal entry uh, in, into Jerusalem. And uh, I want to look at it this morning from Matthew's gospel. Matthew, he was an eyewitness um, to these events, and so let's read what, what, how he recorded it um, in Matthew 21. We're going to read the first uh, verses 1 through 11. It says this, When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples, telling them, Go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her foal. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says, to you, if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter, tell daughter Zion, see, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and its foal. Then they laid their clothes on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread uh, their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them. On the road, and then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed him shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar, saying, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And so, one of the things you need to know is that what does the, the setting for this is Passover. And so everyone came to Jerusalem, all, all Jewish people, uh, good Jewish people came to Jerusalem for the Passover to celebrate. So the city is already kind of bustling. There's already a, a kind of a, 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 lot of, a lot of stuff, a lot of activity is happening. And, and, and here comes Jesus and Jesus is entering. And so he already, people know about him and know what he's done, seen the miracles that he's done and, and watched, listened to his teachings. And so they're, they're kind of already excited. But as, as he's coming in, the crowd grows and grows. And, and so you see more people, and they're there to, to welcome him. And, and a lot of them are excited. A lot of them are excited about his presence. But sometimes when you read, just, just when you read Scripture like that, you don't, you're not able to see kind of the whole picture and see everything else that's going on. And there is what Jesus is doing, and what he's doing is very calculated here um, and as he's entering into Jerusalem. And there's, so there's what he's doing, and there is what the Israelites are hoping for or, or what they're expecting and in this case, the two of them, they, they don't necessarily match, they don't match up. Jesus' triumphal entry is his message to the world that he is, he is the king. He is the long-awaited Messiah. If you, if you read your Bible, you, you notice in, in the New Testament when Jesus does things, often he's telling the person that he heals or the person that he, that, that he ministers to, he's, he's telling them, don't say anything about this. Because what he, in his mind and what Jesus is doing, it wasn't time for him to announce who he was. He had a plan. He knew what he was doing. Uh, and this was, this, was, this was calculated. This was exactly the way it was supposed to happen. And so Jesus is now, now telling the world, now telling the watching world that he is the Messiah, that he is, he is God's son. He's fulfilling the prophecy that was written. Uh, I, I don't know if you knew that, but in our, our passage there, we read uh, a verse. Matthew is quoting Zechariah, Zechariah 9, 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look. Your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, Jesus was coming, and this was was a fulfillment of the prophecy that was written hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The king that they have been hoping for and praying for. The king that was going to finally make everything right. But there's a problem. The people of Israel's idea of Jesus' mission 
and Jesus' mission were, very, were two very different things. You see, Jesus, he was coming as the king, but he was not coming um, like the king that they were expecting. Uh, what were they expecting? I, I think in their minds, they, they were kind of had this idea of how, God would, how God's king would establish the kingdom. And this is what they wanted. Take a look at this picture. So you see this? This is kind of uh, uh, what they were, what I think Israel had in their mind, the Jewish people. Because what you see here is you see a king coming, uh, and you see a king, a king coming ready for battle. He's on his chariot. He's on his, on his horses. He has his soldiers. And that's, that's, what, that's what Israel, that's what the Jewish people were, were looking for. And that, that would have been a logical conclusion that, that the Messiah would wage war against the idol-worshiping Gentiles and destroy the sinners among the Jews. And this was, this was the common belief amongst almost all the Jewish people in Jesus' time. The Messiah was to be the son of David, so he was a descendant of the king of David. So people expected that just like David, David conquered kingdoms to advance God's kingdom, and he did it by war, they, they just assumed that the, that the messianic son of David, that he would do the same thing. And, and, and you go back further in their history, and, and Moses, Moses through, God used Moses to conquer the Egyptians, to destroy the Egyptians' army. And that's what they were looking for. That's what they were expecting. The, the idea that the Messianic king would lead a rebellion, was, it was the main expectation for the Messiah in Jesus' time. The Jewish people, they, they, they really got caught up in, in what we like to call nationalism. It was just this whole deal about us. They, they wanted to be a powerful nation again. They, they were God's chosen people, and what that meant to them was that, that they were supposed to be the people that God was going was to the, rule the world through and kind of reestablish his kingdom, and, and Jesus was going to be their ruler king. They were ready for Jesus to judge the evil Roman Empire and the other Gentiles once and for all. The Jews, they were ready. They were ready for a warrior to be restored back to power. But that's not, that's not what they got. Jesus was king, but he wasn't coming as a mighty warrior. He was coming as the prince of peace. Jesus' kingship, he wasn't trying to establish a kingdom on this world. He was creating, he wasn't creating an earthly, he wasn't creating an earthly kingdom. He was, he was creating an eternal one. They wanted, they wanted a, a, a political Messiah to save them from their enemies. But Jesus was not only coming to, to save the, the Jewish people, but he was coming to save the world, everyone from their sins, and restore their relationship with God. And Jesus wasn't, he wasn't coming to destroy the evil Gentiles, but what he was doing was coming to offer salvation to all. He wasn't, he wasn't that type of king, but he was, he was this type of king. Watch, check the environment. That's, that's how Jesus came. He was, he was not a, a warrior king. He was the suffering servant. He was, he was the picture of humility. He was coming not to take life, but to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come riding on, on horses and chariots, but he came riding on a, on a colt, on a, on a donkey. The donkey was a picture of peace. There were times, and you can go back in Old Testament times, where you see um, leaders who, were riding, who would come in riding donkeys. But when they came in riding donkeys, they weren't coming in for battle, but the donkey was, was, a, was a symbol of peace. It was a picture of peace. And if a king was coming for battle, he'd come on a great horse. He'd, he'd come looking more like that. And, and, but a leader who was coming in peace typically came on donkeys. And donkeys in biblical times... They, they're, they're, they're often mentioned with, with common people. They're used for agricultural purposes. They're, they're working, working animals. And horses mentioned in the Bible are often associated um, with kings and war. But Jesus came riding in on this, on this, on this fold, this colt. And he was, coming, he was coming to establish his reign as Messiah, who would rescue sinners and call all people to follow him. Jesus came. He did come to conquer but he came to conquer sin through love, through grace and mercy and sacrifice, even his own sacrifice. He came to conquer hearts and minds, not nations. And as one writer put it, he said it was difficult for the people, even those who were close to Jesus, to understand that his ride into Jerusalem um, as the promised Messiah wasn't to ascend to the throne, but it was to go to the cross to give up his life. It's not what the Jewish people wanted, but it was exactly what they needed. Now, we can, we can shake our heads in disappointment at, at 
the people that we read here, we can kind of stand in judgment of them because we, we could say, well, how, how could you guys have missed it? Why would you think Jesus would be a warrior king? Why would you think Jesus would be this mighty king? You knew he was coming. You knew what he was doing. We could say that, but the truth of the matter is, is we're, we're probably all guilty of, of, the, of the exact same thing. We're, we're all guilty of saying, this is what I want God to be. This is how I, got, I want him to be like this, and I want him to be like this, and I want him to be like this. I don't want him to do that. I don't want him to be like that. I, 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 but, and, and definitely not like that. But I, I want it. It's, it's like, have you, ever, have you ever been to a, a Subway a sandwich shop or, or maybe even uh, Pie Five? Some of the great, those are two great places to eat. Uh, Subway, okay, but Pie Five especially. Um, I love their pizza there. And what you do, if you've been there, you know, you, you, start at, you start at one end of the line and you just go down the line and you tell them exactly what you want. You say you want this on your pizza or your sandwich you want this nope not, not that now they might make some, some suggestions on the menu like hey you might want to try this but the beauty of those places is is what you want on your pizza or your sandwich it's put on there and what you don't want it doesn't get on there it's kind of this whole idea of you you build your own and I think that's what we want to do with God sometimes we want to we want to we want to build our own God we, we, we expect God to, to act a certain way, and usually the way that we want him to act is in a way that always benefits us, that makes us, makes us the center. We're like the crowd of people that gathered and, and are welcoming Jesus, saying, Hosanna, except when we're shouting our praises, we're expecting God to be what we want him to be and for his agenda to match up to our agenda. But if it doesn't, guess what happens? If it doesn't match up, then... Those people that were shouting Hosanna, as we're going to see in a few weeks later on, they're the same ones that are shouting crucify him. And for us, if things don't go our way, we, we may not be shouting crucify him, but instead, you know what we do? We pick up our faith and our devotion, we pack it up and we give it to something or someone else who we think will do it our way. We're kind of like a little bit like a little kid. Like, oh, I don't want to play here anymore, God, because you're not doing it by my rules. The game's different and I don't want to play. So they wanted a warrior. They wanted someone to restore them to greatness. They wanted someone to destroy their enemies and get them back to prominence, to be God, to be the, the chosen people. That's what they wanted and that's what they expected, but that's not, it's not at all what they needed. And what I want to do today is I want us to take a look at some things that we expect God to be, things that, that we want but aren't necessarily exactly what we need. And this isn't really an exhaustive list um, as I've list these, you, you can probably think of probably four or five or six, seven, eight more uh, just from your own personal experience. But I want to look at some of just some of the common expectations that we have of God. And then I want to contrast those with, contrast the expectations that we have with the things that we, and when I say we, I'm right in the middle with you, the things that we need. First one is this, is we, we often expect Jesus to be a, a genie in a bottle. You, know, you think, think about Aladdin where you rub the lamp and, and the genie comes out and we, we rub the lamp or we rub the Bible or whatever and, and then all of a sudden we get, we, we get all these wishes. And, and it, sounds, it sounds kind of silly, but that is, that is a popular belief for a lot of people, a lot of Christians who are walking into churches today. God is here to serve me. He's here to grant all my wishes. And the cool thing with God is I don't just get three I get, I get as many as, as I want. He's a God of love, and he cares for me so much that he wants to give me, he wants to give me what I want. Like, I'm poor, God, so you know what? You need to give me money. I'm sick, God, so you just, just make me feel better. I'm lonely, God, so give me friends. I don't like how my job's going, God, so give me another job. God, my marriage is hard. I don't want it to be hard. Give me another marriage. God, my church is, I don't like my church. God, change my church. And a lot of us, that's, that's kind of how we, we've reduced prayer we, we, we've made prayer into just, this, this, just a bunch of wishes that we're throwing up to God and hoping that He grants them. And how often do we treat God like our personal genie, asking only for things that we want uh, and, and things that, that, that would help us just personally? And sometimes we're not even asking. We're, we're sort of demanding for the things that benefit us in some way. And yet, in our prayer life, we... We, we never maybe sometimes find the time to spend praising and thanking God for who He is and for what He's already done in our lives and for how He's blessed us. 
and, and taking the needs of others before God. But we just get so focused on what we want. James, this isn't in your outline, but James 4, 3 says, you ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. We expect God to be at our beck and call. He's our genie. But we don't need a genie. What we need is, is we need a savior. We need a savior. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5 says, and you were dead in your, listen to these words, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the, in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and our thoughts. You catch the theme here? Before, we were just living for ourselves, living for ourselves, living for ourselves. And we were by nature children under wrath, as others were also. But God... Thank you for that part. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in our trespasses. You are saved by grace. You see, without Jesus, we're, we're dead in our sins. Why? Because we live according to the ways of the world. The ways of the world are opposite of God. And we, we follow a lifestyle, our own lifestyle, that would just lead to disobedience. We give in to, to these fleshly desires. But thanks be to God that he was merciful and didn't give us what we were wanting, but instead gave us a way to be forgiven and offered uh, a new life in Christ because that's, that's what we need. We're saved by his grace. If God was just this genie for us, then all we would ask for would be things that we would ask him to grant all of our selfish desires. And all of those things, all those things do, all our selfish desires do, all living for the flesh, the only thing that does or accomplishes in our life is it just pulls us away from him. It leads, it leads to our death, our eternal death. They, they, they lead us away from him, but God made a way for us to come, come back to him. Because we needed, we needed him. We needed a savior. Ephesians, later on in, in chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, it says, at that time, you were without Christ. Listen to this. Excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenant of promise. Without hope, without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You see, before Jesus... We were excluded, excluded from citizenship. We weren't citizens of God's kingdom. We were foreigners. In other words, a, a foreigner to God. We didn't know God. God, um, with, we were without hope. And I don't think, I, I think sometimes we don't get the, the real severity of those statements. No citizenship in his kingdom, no covenant promises, no hope. We had none of it until Jesus came to shed his blood on that cross. And I love the, 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 the phrase there in verse 13. You who were far away have been brought near that's that's what we need we need to be brought close to god we don't need all of our wishes granted we need all our sins to be forgiven nothing this world has to offer is greater than that love and the sin offering that was given on our behalf when jesus went to the cross in our place we want we want a genie but we need a savior Another thing we expect from, from Jesus is, is we expect him to be our easy button. Do you ever see an easy button uh, like at Staples? It's just a button, red button that just says easy on it. And you just get to tap it and it makes everything easier. Staples, uh, the office supply company, came up with this ad campaign. And, and the whole idea behind it was Staples could make your life make your life easier with all of their office solutions. With their printing, with their paper, with their printer, printer stuff, all the stuff. You just... The whole idea, hit that easy button and life would be good. Some of you may have one of those in your office or in your home. Uh, it'd be really cool if they actually worked. Now that would be awesome because then we'd probably need to start buying some for different areas of our life. We'd need an easy button for our marriage. We'd need an easy button for, our, for, for you know, delete, dealing with our kids, deleting our kids, uh, you know, however you do that. <laughs> dealing with our kids. Do not delete your kids. We do not condone that here at FBC Allen. Dealing with our kids, they would like to have one, and dealing with parents, uh, with at school, with at work, and our, with our friendships, we, we'd love to have. I know what I would do with my easy button right now. I would, I would leave right now if I had an easy button and just let you guys sing with Jeff, and I'd go to Uncle Julio's, and I'd order just a bunch of fajitas and all the flour tortillas I could eat, and then I would eat it until I just got sick, and then I'd walk to the gym, and I'd hit the easy button, and it would all go away. 
That's how I would use mine. See, selfish desires. <laughs> That's what I would do with mine. And, and you know, it, you think about it. The easy button, it would just change our world. Everything would be so easy. And sadly, a lot of us expect that that's exactly what Jesus is going to do for us. He's going to make our lives easy. It's, it's kind of similar to that whole genie in a bottle idea. God, can you just clear the path so that the road before me is just smooth? God, just, just no, 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 no bumps in the road, no rocks on the trail, no, you know, no potholes, no anything. I just need it to be smooth, God. It's like in, in, you know, on 75, an early Monday morning, if you could just, the traffic just parted and just made it easy to get to work. God, my, 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 my spouse doesn't understand how difficult they are, you know, or they never listen. So God, if you would just change my spouse and make everything easier. God, God my parents, they're just so unreasonable. They just ask me to do, they don't get it. God, if you could just help them, God, to see things my way. You know, the, 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 the whole idea behind the easy button, I, I think in this context, what we're talking about is it's kind of saying, you know what, God, I'm definitely not the issue here. It's not me, but it's, it's, it's everyone else. So God, if, if you would change the people around me, then my life would be good. Change my spouse, change my kids, change my boss, change my neighbors, change my church, change, all, change my circumstances. In other words, God, just leave me alone. I'm good. I'm comfortable, I'm content, but if you could just change some of the things around me, it sure would make my life a whole lot more simple. And we expect him to make it easy, but what we really need is we need Jesus as Lord. We need Jesus to be Lord in our lives and let him be Lord. Acts 2.36 says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. It's both. A lot of us like the, 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 we call, you know, my Savior and Lord. A lot of us like that Savior part because we've been rescued from our sins. We've been rescued from an eternity separated from Him. But that Lord part is the part that we, we kind of get stumbled on. We want to be in charge, but we've already established, we said this in the first point, we've already established based on Scripture the limitations of life if we are in charge because the only thing that we would do is we would serve ourselves and that leads to destruction. Because of Jesus' death and his resurrection, he proved, he proved who he was. That who he said he was, that he actually was. He was the Son of God. He was God in the flesh. And he was just not our Savior, but he was also Lord. He is boss. He is in charge. And so as Lord, we shouldn't be asking God to make life easier, but instead we should be asking God, help me to follow you. The wrong, the wrong thing to ask is, God, to make my life easy. But the better question is, God, help me. I want to follow you. Let, let me follow you. Our goal should not be to make our lives simpler, but to make our lives more like Christ. You probably, um, if you, you probably need to write that down because and, and, that's a reminder that I, know I need a lot of times. Is the goal of life isn't to make life simpler, but the goal of life is to make us more like Christ. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 10 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. Be sober-minded. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Resist. Resist him firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you've suffered a little while. Putting ourselves in God's rightful place of Lord of our lives is the opposite of humbling ourselves. Now, you, you may not have heard this in a long time, but I want to say it because, again, it's a phrase that I need to hear myself, but it's not about you, and it's not about me. This world's not about you. It's not about me. The devil wants us to think that. Okay? The enemy, he wants, to, he wants to act like he's our friend. He wants us to think that. And he is. He's like a, 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 the verse said of prowling around like a roaring lion, just looking for anyone that he can devour. Now, notice that word devour. What do you think that word devour means? It's not something that he wants to just nibble on. 
Not something that he just wants to, wants to play with or toy with for a little while. Nope. It's something that he wants to devour. In other words, he wants to destroy us. That's his only agenda. And he knows that one of the best ways that he can get us and destroy us is to make us think that everything is about us. Because if he can turn us towards ourselves, then he's turning us away from God. You know, and, and wishing that your life was easy just kind of sets yourself up for failure. Because as many of you can testify, life is not easy. It's not easy. There, it has easy times. There are, there are times that are easy or seasons that are easier than others. And I think, we're, I think really kind of what, what if we boil down to it, that where we're getting at when we say, God, make my life easy, we're kind of saying, God, could you, make it, could you make it that my life is so easy that I really don't even need you? Because if life is easy, then what do I need God for? And watch out for that type of thinking. Get out of the way and let God be Lord. Let him be Lord. And we just, and as we just read in 1 Peter, no matter what you face in life, he will be there to restore you, to strengthen you, to support you. So when life isn't easy, because it's not going to be easy, God's there. Listen to those words, to restore you, to strengthen you, to support you. Saying you want to be life is, is, is saying to God, take away all, if you say that you want life to be easy, you're, you're kind of saying, God, take away all the things that would actually grow me. Which leads us to, to um, this last expectation that we have is, is what we want is we, we want God in life to just make sense. That's what we expect. God, you, you, we, I need you to make sense. And this is a huge one for a lot of us. Huge one for a lot of people. This is, I think this is one of the main reasons why so many people walk away from God because he doesn't make sense to them. And the big question that, that is always asked is why? Why? Why, God? Why did you allow this to happen? Why didn't you intervene in this situation? God, you said that you were this, fill in the blank, and, and, but yet you let that happen. Why? Where were you, God, when this happened? Why, why weren't you present? Why weren't you there? I don't understand, God. And I know that those questions come from, from a real place, from a real heart, and, and you're seeking to understand. And, I, and I've asked those questions too. I've asked those why questions. But if we're honest, this all goes back to this whole idea of wanting God to be what we want God to be and not trusting Him for who He is. Not trusting His plan, not trusting His wisdom, not trusting His promises, not trusting His authority, not trusting His way of leading, not trusting His way of, of, of us wanting how He wants us to live life and the things that that he allows in our lives. We expect God to make sense, but that's not what we need. What we need is, is, is we need to grow our faith. We need to grow our faith. And our faith grows just like our, our muscles grow. They, 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 we get stronger through resistance. Our faith grows through resistance. You don't get stronger by lifting weights that don't require any effort on your part. Your faith won't grow when you are, when you are in situations where there is absolutely no faith required and i get why you want to be there i i i'm just like you i get the testing of your faith is it's scary why do i want to take a step of faith when i'm perfectly comfortable right here but in james chapter one it, it tells us why it's important james one verses two through four says consider it nothing but joy my brothers and sisters whenever you fall into various trials be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace and let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work so that you may be perfect and completely developed in your faith lacking nothing there is purpose in your pain there's purpose in your trials there's purpose in those tests of your faith it's not meant to make your life miserable although you may feel like that sometimes that's not the point it's meant to make you more like Christ. And by the way, that's the goal of our living. We said that earlier. It's, it's to be more like Christ. It's not about you. It's about the Lord. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to be more like God. The tests and the trials, they create this endurance. It's easy to follow God when God makes sense. You remember, um, if, if, you, if you've read the, the New Testament, there's, there's times where Jesus is talking and he's telling people, 
He's kind of going through the whole idea of here's, here's how you're used, to, you're used to doing life, but here's how I say you should do life. And one of the things that he said was is that you should, you should love your enemies and pray for those who hurt you. And one of the things that he said while he, was, while he was doing all that was he was kind of saying, listen, it's easy. Everybody can love the people that love them. That nothing's required of that. Even, even, even the devil understands that. It's easy to, you can love someone who loves you, but it takes, it takes more to love someone who persecutes you. It takes more to, to try to care for someone who, who doesn't care a thing about you. It, it, it takes more to pray for the people who are trying to persecute you. It takes more to, to turn the other cheek than to, than to try to get revenge. It takes, it takes faith. And you have to grow your faith. And one of the ways that you're going to grow that faith is you're put into positions, you're put into situations where your faith, you're required to, to kind of flex that faith muscle to be stronger. It's easy to trust God when life is easy, but you don't grow in easy times. We grow when we're stretched. Uh, I love this quote by Rick Warren. He said, the ultimate test of faith is not how loudly you praise God in happy times, but how deeply you trust him in dark times. It's easy to say, I love you, Lord, when life is going great. But what about when life is difficult? What about when our faith is being stretched? Later on in James chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because, here's why, here's why, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. There is going to be a reward for your faithfulness. There's going to be a reward for your faithfulness. Now, it's, it's, it's not going to be a, a, a big bag of money. It's not going to be a new car or, or perfect health. I don't know. Jesus may choose. God may choose to bless you with those things. But the, 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 the reward, um, the, the blessing that God is going to give, it has nothing really to do with earthly possessions, but has everything to do with what God is trying to create in all of us. God may not always make sense, but like we told the kids earlier, God is always faithful. He may not always make sense, but he is always, always faithful. So when, when the people were shouting Hosanna when Jesus was making his way into Jerusalem, um, the, the word, it was a Hebrew word that they were shouting, and it, it literally means, um, it's kind of like, almost like, it's like, I'm begging you to save or, or please deliver us. And they were right to shout that, although they were looking for a different type of deliverance. They were looking for, for a deliverance from an evil Roman empire. Jesus was coming to deliver them from a, from a greater enemy. It's not what they expected, but it's exactly what they needed. And my prayer is that we would shout Hosanna today in our hearts and in our minds. And we would, we would surrender ourselves to His will and his desire for our life. Let's stop expecting God to be what, what we want him to be. Let's stop trying to create, stop trying to build our own God and start trusting him for who he is and let's allow him to be exactly what he needs to be for us. And here's the big one, and allow him to do exactly what he needs to do in us.